Heavenly Father, we love you, we praise you, and we give you all the glory, Lord. Everything that we are, that we can say that we've done is through you. Continue to bless us, Lord. Continue to help us walk in your ways. Guide our paths. We are nothing without you, Lord. Send your Holy Spirit to guide us. Help us to do your will. We give you the praise and the glory for it. Amen. We pray for Carl's uh, evangelistic team. Move in a mighty way. Prepare hearts. Draw them by your spirit. Open their eyes. The uh, track ministry, open the hearts of these people that they will put the tracks back there for the people that are lost. Even the people that are saved can take them and bring them to people that are lost. And we pray that you'll do a mighty work on that. We pray for the... uh, Supreme Court of this country. We pray for the whole government, Lord, but in particular on this instance, the uh, Supreme Court, they're deciding, this could decide whether to repeal the Roe versus Wade decision that has resulted in millions and millions of babies being slaughtered through the abortion system. It's a big money-making deal, and the Left the government is uh, com- had their complete blessing upon it, and we pray, Lord, that you'll stop the killing of these babies, and and the money that all these people are making off of it. You can do it, Lord. Move on the hearts of those people that can make this decision. It's a very small group of people that can affect millions of people. We love you, Lord. We pray that you'll bless this meeting tonight. Everyone here, open their ears, open their eyes to your word. Bless Carlos, send down your spirit, Lord. Guide him in whatever it is you'd have him to say tonight. And we give you all the praise and glory for it in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, uh, Ed, for praying. That was very appropriate. Let me uh, share the screen. Listen, tonight we are going to cover a paper that uh, was released by the Salvation Army. uh, And the title of it is, uh, Let's Talk About Racism. And uh, Ken is the one who sent it to me. You know, Ken has been very involved with the uh, Salvation Army. And he... uh, he forwarded the paper to me, and we read it. And Ken and Cindy and I kind of covered the first part of it. And that's really all we're going to cover is the first part of it. If you want, we can forward that paper to you all, and you can look at it. I, I just find that it's – once you understand what they're saying, it's like it becomes very redundant and, and, and almost not worth reading the whole thing. It just it becomes very taxing. But I do want us to to just cover it, uh, at least the first part of the paper tonight. I have some notes that we can cover. Also, uh, Andrew was aware of this when we uh, talked with him, and he sent me a a website this morning where the Salvation Army has now rescinded the paper. Because with just within a few days, the the uproar and the, uh, the blowback from this has been so great. And, and people have, you know, said that they're withdrawing their support from the organization. And I, I, I truly believe that it was all monetary is why they, they've rescinded the paper. I, you know, I, I, I don't know if they'll ever recover from this. And I don't wish their demise because within the organization, like, like in so many churches, you have lots of pure-hearted people that are looking for opportunities to serve. And, you know, they, they're, they're genuine, but evidently in the leadership there is real corruption. And uh, so we're going to read the paper, and uh, and then we'll go over some of the notes. We're, we're not going to read. We're going to read the paper. The first couple of pages I didn't put take notes on it, uh, 
but Ken might have, and he can certainly chime in at any point. But I'll, we can go over some of the notes that I did have as I think began on the third page. So the first page is nothing. It's just a graphic saying, uh, you know, let's talk about racism, a resource developed to guide the Salvation Army family in gracious discussions about overcoming the damage racism has inflicted upon our world. And what you're going to find out is that many of the things that they're saying here, you, we're, we, we don't argue against them, many of them, but then there's lots of things that I cannot agree with. Um, so, somebody, hang on here. We we've got to uh, let's mute everybody. Let me mute everybody and uh, okay. For we're having some kind of feedback there, so. Everyone is muted. If you if you have something you'd like to say or share, just unmute yourself. If you're on the computer, hit the microphone. If you're on just the phone, then I think it's star six to unmute yourself. So, Cindy, are you up for reading tonight, or or do you want me to read? No, I can read. That's fine. okay. Can you see the screen here? Yes, sir. And is it big enough? Well, if you can make it a little bigger. <laughs> a little bigger, okay. Little, yeah. How's um, that? That's good. It cuts off. Oh, right. It cuts off on the side, so I guess in a little bit. The wording okay. on the left and right margins is gone. Are you okay there? How's that? <clears throat> that's good. Okay. <clears throat> the salvation. Now the way the way this reads is you have to go through the whole column, and then we have to come back on the right column. Okay. The Salvation Army's International Position Statement on Racism defines racism as the belief that races have distinctive cultural characteristics determined by hereditary factors and that this endows some races with an intrinsic superiority over others. Racism also refers to political or social programs built on that belief. The use of the term race itself is contested, but is generally used to refer to a distinct group sharing a common ethnicity, national origin, descent, and or skin color. Race and racism, however, were born of sinful human design and have no basis in science or biblical thought. The Salvation Army denounces racism in all forms, yet race and racism have created detrimental divisions and harm throughout the earth, even in our Christian schools of thought and methodology, and have led to slavery, caste systems, war, genocide, and unequivocal systems and statuses. Now, let me just say that so much of that is true, but what you're going to notice in this paper is that they, they, they lump race and racism together at, it's intertwined and they don't make a distinction. And uh, <clears throat> I just want us to be aware of the fact that, <clears throat> that God did create the races. Uh, that is not man-made. That is not, uh, you know, as, as he said here, uh, something that, that uh, you know, he says it has no basis in science or biblical thoughts. Well, I, I don't, I think that, it does. I mean, obviously God made the Asians. He made the Africans. He made the Caucasians. He made the Latino. I mean, it just is. Man didn't do that. So now racism is a different thing. That absolutely is not God. But uh, so just bear that in mind as we're reading this. Okay, if you'll continue on here. <clears throat> the resource is designed to foster conversations about racism and race so that we can join together to fight the evil of racism and create a more just and equitable society. Take this opportunity to listen and learn from each other as you open your hearts to what God is speaking to you. Please also keep in mind that this was written within the context of the United States of America and in particular, the African-American experience. 
It is recognized that subsequent conversations and development tools will be needed in fostering a global racism dialogue. So when we were studying this before, uh, Ken pointed out how that, you know, this is, they're making the context that racism, it, it, it's just about here in the United States and referring to the African-American experience. But, you know, it, this uh, racism cuts across all, all groups. And it's not just in the United States, it's, it's worldwide, which he said earlier on in the paper, but now it's like he's saying, well, you know, and I just want to remind people that, you know, we just had an incident up there in Waukesha, Wisconsin, where, you know, the black man drove through the parade route, and uh, evidently from everything that I've read is that he's very racist, and that that was what was driving a lot of what he was doing. So, you know, it... It just, it really galls me to read this, and it is all, it is nothing but critical race theory putting all of the blame on white people, particularly in the United States society. It, it you know, it, it, it's obvious that this has been designed to undermine society in this country. It's a means whereby they can put division for their own means, for their own gains. Okay, if you'll pick it up, and why do Salvationists need to talk about racism? A major component of the Salvation Army's international mission statement is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and to meet human needs in his name without discrimination. However, we can naturally serve our brothers and sisters if we allow dis discrimination and racism to happen around them or even within the Salvation Army. Our international position statement reads, the Salvation Army acknowledges with regret that Salvationists have sometimes shared in the sins of racism if conformed to economic, organizational, and social pressures that perpetrate racism and challenges us to fight against racism. As Salvationists and Christians, we are called to stand against any form of sin or oppression, and racism is no different. In addition, the Salvation Army is a holiness movement, and we believe that our journey towards holiness includes the whole person. One of the founders of the Salvation Army, Catherine Booth, stated that God proposes to restore me heart, soul, spirit, body, every fiber of my nature to restore me perfectly to conform me wholly to the image of his Son. Whole restoration includes embracing diversity as God's design for humanity and rooting out racism, bias, and discrimination from our lives. If we indeed seek to fully meet human needs, we must combat everything that stands against those whom the Salvation Army serves, and racism is not exempt from this decree. As a holy people, we are called to stand against this evil and dispel it from our ranks. So, for the most part, we can agree with everything that's being said there, but we have to dig into it a little bit more. So, here we're, we're starting the third page, and here's where my notes are going to kick in. But let's go ahead and read this, and then we'll go over to my uh, notes. Many have come to believe that we live in a post-racial society, but racism is very real for our brothers and sisters who are refused jobs and housing, denied basic rights, and brutalized and oppressed simply because of the color of their skin. There is an urgent need for Christians to evaluate racist attitudes and practices in light of our faith and to live faithfully in today's world. We need to seek the wisdom and grace of God in every part of our lives. What do we hope to achieve? The desire is that salvationists achieve the following. Understand and acknowledge the def definitions of race and racism and how the social construct of race has affected society. Hear firsthand testimonies of racist treatment and come to appreciate the ways that racism has impacted fellow salvationists. Understand God's design for diverse and unified humanity. Move from the flawed human idea of race and culture 
into God's design and purpose for us to live as a unified, diverse, and equitable people. Lament, repent, and apologize for bias, bias, biases, or racist ideologies held in actions committed. Develop action steps for continued personal and corporate growth towards a posture of humility and anti-racism. Experience God's presence in the middle of their gathering, as Jesus promised in Matthew 18.20. What is included in this resource? Let's talk about racism compromises the following documents, each available separately. Introduction. Session 1. What is the issue? Session 2. Describe and analyze. Session 3, reflect and evaluate. Session 4, decide and plan how then shall we live. Session 5, act. <clears throat> Appendix A, glossary of terms. Appendix B, preparing to participate in courageous conversations. Appendix C, self-care for people of color. Appendix D, what is whiteness? Appendix E, Lamenting and Repenting, a Conversation Guide. Appendix F, Black Voices. Appendix G, Resources, Tools, and Contributors. In this resource, you will find five sessions to help delve into the topic of racism in the church. Each module is designed to be worked through either as an ind individual or as a group with a dedicated facilitator. The aim of the resource is to help participants learn the definitions of race and racism and how these affected society and the church throughout history, unpack God's design for diverse and unified humanity, spend time in prayer, lamentation, and repentance, and develop personal and corporate action steps for continued growth towards a posture of humility and anti-racism. It is recommended that each module is worked through over a 90-minute period, allowing time for group discussion, learning, and sharing of personal stories. However, it is important to note that some conversations may require more time, and this is okay. The most important thing is that participants are learning, sharing, and growing together. Okay, so let me go over to my notes here. Um, and so these are excerpts from what we just read on page three. There's an urgent need for Christians to evaluate racist attitudes and practices in light of our faith and to live faithfully in today's world. My note is there is an assumption being made here that, quote, all Christians, not quote, but in parentheses, that all, that's the assumption, Christians, all Christians have racist attitudes. Well, that's just simply not true. Then it says, understand and acknowledge the definitions of race and racism and how the social construct of race has affected society. The social construct of race. Well, just remember, who, who created us as we are? It's not a social construct. Though we were to, I, I thought we were to be preoccupied with spreading the gospel, not social justice. We're not to be occupied with changing the world. Now, look, I understand that the world is, is going to hell in a handbag, right? But we are not, we have not been called to change the society and the world. I know that for some people that might be hard to comprehend, but look at John 17, 9. This is Jesus saying, I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. And that is the difference, that Jesus did not come to condemn the world, but to save the world. But he is really only preoccupied with those that want to be saved, those that want the truth. So here's my note. The social gospel church's message is preoccupied with the needs of the world, whereas the true disciples of the Lord are preoccupied with ministering the principles of the doctrine of Christ. Hebrews 6, 1 and 2. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works 
and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, and of laying on of hands, and of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. So, what we're not being called to is to change governments. I mean, look, if, if enough people in a nation come to the Lord, we might change the government. But we're not called to that. We're called to minister to individual persons' lives and lead them to Jesus Christ. So he went on and he said, Lament, repent, and apologize for biases or racist ideologies held and actions committed. Again, it's presumptuous in projecting racist attitudes on all Christians. He makes no distinction but lumps all Christians together as racist. Who's the accuser of the brethren? Because within this, the whole context of this paper is trying to make Christians guilty. When maybe there's some that have racist attitudes, but all the Christians that I know don't. And I will say that I have known Christians and do know Christians that were racist, but God is helping them through it all. So Revelation 12, 9 and 10 says, The great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And this whole paper is nothing but an accusation, a condemnation, a judgment that is without basis. And if, he, if this person knows some Christians that are racist, well, that's one thing. Address them. But don't dress, address the whole church as though they're racist. And then there was this uh, comment here in, in page 3. The aim of the resource is to help participants learn the definitions of race and racism and how these have affected society and the church throughout history. I agree that certain denominations in time past have been racist, but this article does not take into account the changes of heart that have happened, particularly in the last 50 years. The implication is that the church is still racist and no progress has been made. The Lord changes us and sometimes it can be a slow change. Ken, Kanda on this call, reminded me how that it took 10 years for the early church to realize that Gentiles were, were to be allowed into the fellowship. That's in Acts 10 and, and chapter 11. Remember, it wasn't until the house of Cornelius that Peter understood that, hey, the Lord is bringing Gentiles into the church. Up until that time, they separated themselves. And you can read Acts 10 and 11 to remind yourself about it. Then he says here, spend time in prayer, lamentation, and repentance, and develop personal and corporate action steps for continued growth towards a posture of humility and anti-racism. The precept of corporate repentance is one that we should outright reject the way he's proposing it. God will hold every individual accountable and not the corporate. So 2 Corinthians 5.10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to what he hath done, whether it be good or bad. It, there's no corporate there. It's the individual. Romans 2, 5 through 11. But after the hardness and impenitent heart treasurest up unto thyself, wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. No corporate there. To them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life, but unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also the Gentile. I underline that because who made that distinction between the Jew and the Gentile? It was God. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. For there is no respect of persons with God. And the thing is, is that even though God has made distinctions in humanity, 
he there's no respect for persons for them. He loves us all equally. As regarding the gospel, there was a reason why the Lord preserved the Jewish race uh, uniquely so that people would recognize that it was God that ordered this thing because that's the whole history of the gospel, the promise being given to Abraham and his descendants. 1 Peter 1.17, And if you call on the Father who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. So judgment is not going to be corporate. It's going to be individual. And the only thing that I would say is that there, the Scripture does talk about times when Israel would present themselves as a corporate body before the Lord and offer up prayer and repentance for, you know, their idolatry as a nation. But ultimately, every individual within that group has to repent for themselves. The corporate can't do it. In other words, just because some people that are that band together within our corporate, let's just take our Bible study here tonight. Let's just say that within us, we all get before the Lord and we repent for whatever, the sins of what's going on with in our nation. But what if some of us aren't repentant? Does the action of the corporate, th does it automatically bestow repentance on those that aren't repentant? No. It comes down to individual repentance. It always has, it always will. And that's why the Lord is going to judge every man according to his works and not the corporate. Let me make this point, that the author of this article wants to impute the sins of the fathers upon the children, contrary to what is written in the precepts of Ezekiel 18, Ezekiel 18, 19, and 20. Yet you say, why? Does not the son bear the iniquity of the father? When the son had done that which is lawful and right, and hath kept all my statutes, and hath done them, he shall surely live. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. So when people, when these people talk about racism and how the acts of racism that have been perpetrated on uh, African Americans throughout the centuries in this country, well, look, it's a matter of those were the sins of the fathers. We don't bear the repercut. We don't bear their sin. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. Neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son, because it's a personal thing. Every person will have to give account. So this whole idea, you know, uh, that is being presented, and by the way, this is, a, again, this is a Marxist ploy. This is how, what they use to divide a nation to be able to, you can't, you can't cause an uprising unless you have people that are dissatisfied. During the Bolshevik Revolution, it was all about class and, and uh, uh, fi finances, financial. You know, it was a proletariat against the bourgeoisie. And, uh, but in this country, you know, even the poorest amongst us have a pretty high standard of living compared to the rest of the world. So they're finding other ways to try to divide the populace, to sow, to, to sow discord, and foment dissatisfaction to hopefully capitalize on it and, uh, you know, come to power. Okay. Uh, I don't know if we should read. I, I, I guess we should read four, but um, if you want to pick that up, Cindy. What happens at a con conversation? This resource is designed to guide a group of 10 to 12 people step by step through the materials. Ideally, the group would need to go through each step in the resource for 90 to 120 minutes on a weekly basis. Keep in mind that it is meant to guide participants chronologically through each step of the conversation. Skipping steps will not achieve the goals of the resource. The goal is not to give correct answers to the questions, but rather to have an authentic conversation. Be open to the Holy Spirit's leading as you deal with a difficult topic that requires a lot of grace. 
Each conversation should begin and end in a time of prayer. Well, I agree 100% with that. Okay, now we're in the second column. What, what preparation is required? We are living in turbulent times, and issues of race and racism are again in prominent view. Since attitudes and behaviors concerning race and racism are often unconscious and deeply embedded in the individual soul and the community, it takes great energy and intentionality to uproot them. It is our hope that participating in this conversation will help lead you and those who share the experience with you to begin the process of transparent engagement. The preparation required begins with the facilitator who will prepare a safe setting for honest and transparent discussion. Here are some ground rules. <clears throat> Participants will recognize the need for confidentiality, trust, and mutual respect. Participants will acknowledge they are all disciples who are seeking to follow Jesus. Participants will be encouraged to speak freely and to try to understand people whose views are different from their own. Participants will permit others to speak without interruption and will allow time for everyone to speak and participate. Participants will not exclude or victimize those who disagree with them. This is equally true when referring to the views of people who are not in the room. Participants will recognize the potential for certain statements or views to trigger powerful responses in others. Just be aware and do your best to respond from a settled soul. Participants will recognize that there is a need to understand why people believe what they believe and there is no room for different opinions within one army. Doubt, unresolved questions, and uncertainties are okay. Not all conversational groups will discuss issues of race and racism in the same way. The conversations must be respectful of local culture and those participating in the conversation. The aim is not for all salvationists to get to the same place or for all conversations to be concluded by a fixed date. It is more important that people have opportunity to talk and learn about race and racism in their own context. So when he says the aim is not for all salvationists to get to the same place, we're going to address that a little later on here. But let me go to my notes here on uh, page four. He said skipping steps will not achieve the goals of the resource. The goal is not to give correct answers to the questions, but rather to have an authentic conversation. Now that should, when you hear someone say something like that, that, that should just put up your spiritual antenna and just, so here's my notes. The goals of the resource are to indoctrinate because the correct answers is the pursuit of the truth. Anything short of that serves to indoctrinate because the implication is that there is no absolute truth. We believe the scriptures are absolute truth and we evaluate everything by the light of the scriptures and not the ever-changing beliefs of man's wisdom, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. You just have to go read that chapter sometime. So authentic conversation can only be defined in the light of Scripture, not man's opinion. And brethren, those of us that are serving the Lord, it has to be the Scriptures. So... The goals of this resource, to me, are very clear that it's for indoctrination purposes and not to indoctrinate us in the gospel of Jesus Christ, but in critical race theory, which is all, very, you know, everybody's pretty well familiar with that. So it says here, the aim is not for all salvationists to get to the same place. In other words, he doesn't want unity. Ephesians 4, 1 through 6, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one Lord, there is one body, one Spirit, even as you are called, and one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, 
who is above all and through all and in you all. So you see how that one, 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 okay? I think the truth must lead us to the same place. Not my will, but thy will be done. It's not my opinion that counts, but God's opinion. And since there's only one body, one spirit, one hope of our calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all, then there can only be one opinion, and it cannot be man's opinion. 1 Corinthians 2, 4 through 13. So, again, so much of what is being talked about in this paper is, is it's man's wisdom. It's not according to the, it's not being faithful to the truth of the scriptures. Okay, let's go back over here to page five. A note for the facilitator. Are you there, sir? I'm coming. <laughs> okay. If you are working through, let's talk about racism is a small group. A facilitator will host each conversation. This resource aims to help the facilitator inform and inspire the conversations. Each module contains questions aimed to help the conversation flow. The group facilitator may decide to omit some questions. The goal is not to give correct answers, but rather to have a genuine conversation, being open to the Holy Spirit's leading. The facilitator can decide whether to give a copy of this resource to participants before the conversation takes place or to work through its content during the session. Before the conversation, invite. People need to be invited to attend the conversation. No one should be forced to participate. When people are invited, they need to be informed as to the nature of the conversation and the confidentiality and respectful behavior that is expected. Facilitators are asked to make sure every participant has read the introduction. This will help people prepare for the conversation. <coughs> Two, prepare. Facilitators should have studied this resource before facilitating the conversation. Three, anticipate the risks. Talking about racism is personal. Some people hold strong opinions, and many have had experiences which have affected them deeply. Consider the risks and prepare as much as possible. Confidentiality must be respected. Four, ensure all participants have read the information and preparing to participate in courageous conversations, Appendix B, and completed the Let's Talk About It Racism Participant Survey, Appendix B. What happens after the conversation? Once the conversation has concluded, participants are encouraged to further explore the issues discussed in their own time or with other members of the group. Step five will guide participants through a personal and corporate action plan that will help participants create steps for their journey forward. Additional resources for further study can be found in the appendices and each participant will be asked to complete an online post-conversation survey to help at assess their growth. <clears throat> okay, now listen, from this point on, I'm just going to cover my notes, because I think what I want you, you know, you get the gist of what he's saying, and now he's just kind of laying the groundwork of how you're supposed to conduct these meetings where the church is going to get together to discuss their racist attitudes. So uh, I'm just going to go strict, strictly to the notes. And you, if you want, you want to read this. I think it's a little taxing to, to to take on the whole paper. But if you'd like to, certainly we can send it to you. But I'm going to start you out here on page five. It says the goal is not to give correct answers, but rather to have a genuine conversation, being open to the Holy Spirit's leading. My notes. This individual wants us to believe that the Holy Spirit would lead us to something other than the correct answer. That's what he's implying here. That uh, The goal is not to give correct answers, but be open to the Holy Spirit's leading. But do you think the Holy Spirit is not going to lead you to the correct answers? So John 16, 13, how be it when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. 
So the Holy Spirit is not going to lead us to anything that is not the correct answer. Otherwise, we could not trust his guidance. 1 Corinthians 1.10 Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Well, how does that, how do, how does that jive with the goal is not to give correct answers? If there's no correct answers, then we're, we're not going to come up to the same. It's just absurd. Okay, then it says that each participant will be asked to complete an online post-conversation survey to help assess their growth. Help assess their growth? This person is thinking more highly of himself than he ought because he's putting himself in the place that only the Holy Spirit can be in. No one has the right to assess a believer's growth except the Holy Ghost. 2 Corinthians 3.18 But we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed in the same image from glory to glory even as by the Spirit of the Lord. It is only the Spirit of the Lord that can change us. Therefore, it is only the Spirit of the Lord who can assess our growth. Now I'm going to go up to page 7, which was the next thing that I... That doesn't mean there aren't other issues in page 6 or whatever. You, you'll read them and if you want. But he says in page 7, race is not biological. It's a social construct. What utter nonsense. God has made the races not social interaction. You know, it, it, God has made us however he wanted us to be. Okay, then he says, the reason sociologists say race is a social construction is because what it means to be white, black, Latin, Asian, and so on is defined according to culture, time, and place. The meanings of these categories have changed over time. What has not changed is that racial groups are placed into a hierarchy with white or lighter-skinned people at the top. Well, again, this is just such an assumption. And obviously, he's, he, I, as he said earlier, he's talking about the United States and particularly the African-American community. Well, the truth is that white, black, Latin, and Asian is not defined just according to culture, time, and place. It has biological, it has physiological determining factors. You look at someone who's Asian, and you can tell they're Asian. You look at someone who's black, and you can tell they're black, and on and on and on. So what God wants us to do is appreciate what he's created and the variety and the diversity, as they like to say. But, they're, you know, God does have diversity, and I'm glad for it because I like looking at different things and appreciating. It just is. What this person fails to note is that attitudes have changed with regard to race, but he believes that they have not. This teaching is promoting racism rather than correcting it. This is the fundamental flaw with critical race theory, is that it in fact is driving a wedge between races. And it's trying to accentuate the differences for obvious reasons. Okay, then he says, this is because race rests on ideas of physical traits and thus describes what people in power think we look like with little regard for how we see ourselves. Well, the truth is, he says up here that, you know, what has not changed is that racial groups are placed into a hierarchy with white or lighter-skinned people at the top. Well, that might be the case in times past in the United States, but do you think that's the case in Asia? Do you think that white and light-skinned people uh, are in power in Asia? Or how about in Africa? Now, people say, well, yeah, but the colonialists went... Well, they did, for sure, but before then there wasn't, and, and, they're not there, and they're not now in power. It's just, like I said, if you can just see the object of all of this, to sow discord, and we know who's behind that. So it's how God, it says, this is because race rests on ideas of physical traits and thus describes 
what people in power think we look like with little regard for how we see ourselves. Well, it is how God sees us that matters. And we want to see ourselves as God sees us. That's what we're all working to when we're pressing toward the mark of the calling of God, and the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, is to see things the way that God sees them and adjust our lives accordingly. In page 8, racism also refers to the system of social advantage and disadvantage or privilege and oppression that is based on race. Racism is a marriage of racist policies and racist ideas that produces and normalizes racial inequities. My note says, except that it is not man that prospers us and provides us opportunities. It is God, Psalm 75, 6 and 7. For promotion cometh neither from the east nor the west nor from the south, but God is a judge. He put it down one, setteth up another. 2 Corinthians 9, 8 through 11. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. As it is written, he hath dispersed abroad, he hath given to the poor, his righteousness remaineth forever. Now he that ministereth seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food, and multiply your seed sown, and increase the fruits of your righteousness, being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, which causes us to, which causes through us thanksgiving to God. Listen, here's my note. It is God who produces opportunity for me and not my race. If God desires to promote me, no racial bias can prevent it. And that has been the case down through history. And, you know, Ken and I were talking about Joseph. He, Ken brought up the, you know, Joseph was in a minority class. He was a Jew in Egypt, and they weren't looked on favorably. He ended up in prison, as we know the whole story, but then he ended up as being second in charge of the whole land of Egypt. God promotes who he wants, when he wants, regardless of race or whatever. And so this whole idea, sure there's racial inequalities, sure there's racial discrimination, but the point is if we're serving God, he'll take care of us. He's never promised that he's going to make us rich. He's never promised that we're going to take over the world. That That is another teaching that I'm not going to address tonight, but uh, the, the, the the, the post-tribulation uh, uh, they think that that is what's going to happen. But look, God is about changing men's hearts to see things the way that he intended. All right, and this is part two, and I'm just going to hit a couple of things that I think they're important, and, and we're going to wrap it up. This was done to determine the risk factor of federally backed mortgages. He's, he's making the point that, that racial inequality is something that's been perpetrated, and it's been... Part of the perpetration of it was through federally backed mortgages. Hazardous neighborhoods, those with highly populated by African Americans and immigrants, were marked off in maps in red, and as a result, black Americans were denied access to mortgage refinancing and federal underwriting opportunities. Right? So it was like the, the system was designed to keep blacks and minorities oppressed and down because, you know, they lived in. To, you know, in those communities. So here's my note. While I'm sure this policy was enacted, there's a different, is there a different mitigating factor? Was the policy simply designed to keep minorities in poverty, or was it impoverished neighborhoods that drew minorities because they were more affordable, older housing in need of repair? But although racism may have been the motivation, we cannot discount the fact that income played a part. What I can say with biblical authority is that usury was forbidden to be practiced among the Jews by God because it does take advantage of the neediest and serves to enslave a people. And I, the reason I'm bringing this up is because, look, when they talk about these uh, disadvantaged neighborhoods, there's a reason why minorities end up in these neighborhoods, why immigrants end up in these, because they're, they're poor. Now, they... They want to make the argument that they've been made to stay poor, 
But I'm making the argument that, look, if people serve the Lord, God isn't necessarily going to make them rich, but he will provide for them. And there are many of the Lord's people that live in impoverished neighborhoods and will continue to live, but they're going to be in heaven one day. It's like the design. We're not here to fix the world. This isn't a social gospel that we're preaching. We're here to direct men to repentance and to get their lives right with God. So no matter what their station in life is, that they're prepared for eternity. The poor we're always going to have with us, Jesus said. And there are always going to be the poor amongst us, the believers. And that's why in Matthew 25, Jesus said he's going to separate the sheep from the goats. How is he going to separate them? He says because the sheep are the ones who when they saw their brethren in need, they helped them when they, you know, through all the different things. That's the difference. And so God is always going to have the needy amongst our ranks so that we will have fruit unto eternal life, so that he will be able to make the determination between the sheep and the goats. It's just, it just is. So here's the thing about usury, because I think this is something that we should consider. Exodus 22, 21 through 27, this is what the Lord said. Thou shalt neither vex a stranger, that would be an immigrant, nor oppress him. For ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. Ye shall not afflict any widow or fatherless child. If thou afflict them in any wise, and they cry at all unto me, I will surely hear their cry. And my wrath shall wax hot, and I will kill you with the sword, and your wives shall be widows, and your children fatherless. If thou lend money to any of my people that is poor by thee, thou shalt not be to him as a usurer. Neither shalt thou lay upon him usury. If thou at all take thy neighbor's raiment to pledge, thou shalt deliver it unto him by that that the sun goeth down. For that is his covering only. It is his raiment for his skin wherein he shall sleep. And it shall come to pass when he crieth unto me that I will hear, for I am gracious. What I don't see is the church, with few exceptions, or the Salvation Army helping needy families in paying off their mortgages and eliminating usurious practices against them. I do see people being encouraged to become reliant on organizations who use their dependency as a means to continue raising money for the enslaving programs. In the case of government programs, the goal is to have a dependent block of voters who have become reliant on government for their sustenance to continue to vote in those who have enslaved them. Why aren't we teaching and encouraging people to help one another escape the bonds of usurious practices? This is one thing that I've really liked about the, uh, the Amish and Mennonite communities, you know, where they have the barn raising things. They, the communities help one another. And, but in, in Christian circles, it's like, uh, I, I, you know, Business is business, brother. I mean, I know you're a brother, but, you know, business is business. And it's like, yeah, we'll lend you money, but, uh, you know, I want a 12% return and, or, or vice versa, whatever it is. Well, what does the scripture say? Are we supposed to do that? No. Because we're supposed to remember that at one time we were strangers. Or at one time our ancestors were strangers. And we're supposed to try to help those amongst us. That's the key, amongst us. Remember, Jesus said, I pray not for the world, but for those whom thou hast given me. <clears throat> In communities of color, <clears throat> maternal mortality is three times out of neighboring white communities. And black and brown people have worse clinical outcomes for the treatment of chronic conditions, such as diabetes, kidney disease, sickle cell, and various forms of cancer. Let's point out that abortion clinics are far more prevalent in black and brown communities, which was the intent of the founders of Planned Parenthood, to tear down those minorities due to the racist motives in the hearts of the founders, such as Margaret Sanger. 
Also, unfortunately, there are genetic traits that some minorities suffer from that make them more susceptible to certain diseases. But that is biological, and their susceptibility is not determined by racism. And this is what I hate about Marxists. They want it, they take facts and they twist them and show them in a different light for, to serve their narrative. <clears throat> when the reality is, is that blacks, for some reason, they do suffer more from diabetes and from sickle cell. And it may be due to obesity and some factors like that, but sickle cell in particular is something that they're far more prevalent in the African-American community than in other communities. Just as there are certain diseases that plague the Jewish community that don't plague other communities. These aren't racist things. These communities are also more likely to be medically underinsured or have no insurance at all. While it's true that past that, that due to past poverty they didn't have access to as much medical care, I think every person can go receive medical ten attention and the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, enables them to be covered. I mean, supposedly that's what Obamacare was supposed to do, and as far as I know, it does. Nobody can be refused medical care. And the truth is, even before then, you could go to an emergency room and they couldn't refuse you. What I think is true is that minorities oftentimes have a mistrust of medical procedures <clears throat> because of inhumane practices carried out upon them by the government in the past, and therefore there is a reluctance in going for medical treatment. We're just about finished here. Just bear with me a couple, a few more minutes. Policy initiatives show that though black Americans and white Americans use drugs at similar rates, the former population are incarcerated at a rate of six times that of the latter. Incarceration of many of these individuals is not necessarily directly on drug charges, but on other crimes committed to obtain drugs. And so black Americans, yes, they're more poverty prone. They're not, and so yes, they commit crimes. And it may be for drugs, it may not be, but the incarceration is rate, it, it's like, they, they, they want to say that incarceration is done strictly on racial lines. And although that may be true to a, a certain extent, it isn't altogether. If a person breaks the law, they break the law, regardless of your color. If you notice, I'm having to address these issues more on logic, and we're getting away from biblical quotes. And that's because that's what man's wisdom is wanting to do. It wants to get you away from the scriptures. It wants to get you away from the precepts of the Bible and get you drugged down in their logic. And that's why I, I pretty much stopped at this point. I have one little last little thing here. He says on page 20, while the Jews tried to make physical requirements such as circumcision and heritage necessary for drawing near to God, he says it was the Jews, not God. But I, here's my notes. It was not the Jews, but God who did this. Genesis 17, 9 through 14. God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised, and you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man child in your generations. He that is born in the house or bought with money of any stranger, which is not of thy seed. He that is born in thy house and he that is bought with thy money must needs be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised man child, whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. So, you know, this guy, it just, it really upsets me when people are out there advocating supposedly for God's truth, and they're not presenting God's truth at all. 
In fact, they're pretending they're, they're presenting lies. So the bottom line is this, brethren. That's as far as I took it. You all, if you want to read that paper, you can. It's it's pretty taxing. The the point I'm, I want to make is that look, yes, there is racism in the world. I have experienced racism, and, and you might say, well, how is that? You're you're white. Yes, I'm I'm a Latino. And as a kid, in certain circumstances, when people knew that I was a Latino, there was some racist attitudes that were demonstrated to me. Did I hate those people? No. It might have made me feel a little uncomfortable, but no, I didn't. But let me tell you where I've really experienced the racism. Where I really experienced racism is when I've been in Latin America amongst my people, Latinos, where, you know, because I didn't look like an Indian because I was white and I was taller, they, you know, they, they point you out. In Mexico, if you're a, a white person, they, they call you a guero. And, you know, they, it, 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 look, it works both ways. It just is. We're going to have to learn how to deal with this. But what I will say is this, my brother, that no matter where I've gone to in the world, when I get together with God's people, I don't experience racism. So my experience has been that with those that truly love the Lord, they're not looking at our outward appearance. And what I will say is that, yes, I have known some Christians who their generations were born in the South. They were part of the Confederacy. Their churches taught them that black people didn't have souls, so they were subhuman. And that has been believed by many Christians in the South for decades. I had a pastor uh, talk to me one time and said, you know, look, this is what I was taught, and I'm having to learn how to, 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 to get away from that because I realized that I was taught falsely. And they're struggling he says, I'm struggling, but I know what I, I need to do, and, and I'm working through it. And I think that is the right thing. And those are, are the brethren that need to be applauded. But papers like this that condemn and that, you know, it's just, it's awful. And uh, I don't know. I don't know if the Salvation Army, what they're going to do and, and how they're going to deal with this, but... Uh, it was not good. It certainly was. Has anybody else got something they'd like to share or anything as we get ready to close? I just wanted to cover all of this as much as I could and uh, and just give you a, a fair understanding of how I see it. You might read the paper and see it differently, but I, I, I just want you to understand that there are some things being put out in this paper that are not right, and it is critical race theory. And that's the problem with our, you know, institutions today is they're presenting this stuff, but they're not telling you what it really is. Anyway, anyone else like to share anything before we get ready to close out tonight? Yeah, like I said, the point I brought out, we talked about, you know, like you're, you're, you're back. Can you, uh, can you get closer to the microphone? I can barely hear you. Hold on. Let me try this. Is that better? A little bit. Is that better? Yes. Okay. Oh, well, here's here's what I want. I'll put. Is that better now? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, the thing that I said, you know, you you pointed out scripture verses, but nowhere in this whole paper has any scripture verses been referenced, other than at the very beginning in Matthew 18. If we, you know, we we all agree together or pray together, uh, I forget how it's. Uh, I had it down here how it was worded. Uh, yeah, it's where like that we, if we gather together in His name. Yeah, right? and, and agree. Mm -hmm. If two of you here on earth concerning anything you ask for, for where two or three are gathered as my followers, I am right. there among them. Other than that, and the other thing, as we are reading, as you're reading this tonight, the other thing that came to my mind, you know, you're reading. We're going through uh, stuff that he's quoting about different different things with uh, racial and the, the thing where, where blacks with the with the uh, the living situations. 
any other paper you read, they have asterisks where they quote, you have references where they pull these quotes from. Right. That's not even here. Interesting. I didn't know. It never occurred to me. You're right. Yeah, unless it's at the end of the paper, but there's nothing where, you know, I, this quote is from this this study or this quote is from that study. You know, it's, there's, it just, it's stuff maybe he has heard, but did he research it to see if those facts are true? Yeah, I, I mean, to me, it's just what I don't understand, as we discussed, is it's how this got through all the leadership at Salvation Army. And they approved it to be presented out there as their doctrine. I, I, I just, it, it's mind-boggling. Yeah. It really is. But, you know, within the Salvation Army, I, as I said earlier, there are so many people that are pure-hearted, really love the Lord, and, and do want to do, and, I, I mean, this isn't the face of the Salvation Army. But how they're going to repair all of this, I, I don't know. Well, I, I liken it to, we talked about, like, the Democratic Party. You know, the, in, the, in the strict leftists, you know, there are all those people up in power for that, but the majority of people in the United States are not for any of that. Uh, it's the same thing here. You've got those few select ones, like, who was ever writing his paper or in charge of that. Well, apparently, when he was writing, you know, it, it said approved by the general, but apparently maybe the general had somebody say, well, here – has someone who reads stuff for him, say, like, do a report on this, study this, let me know, is this right or is it off or where it is. And if they, they say, no, it's fine, well, then he just signs off on it. Uh, I don't know if that's the case, but uh, I have a feeling that might be. Well, you know, that would be such a, a miscarriage of his authority and responsibility. Yeah. It's like if someone gives me a doctrinal paper, Man, I am absolutely going to read it and look over before I give my stamp of, of approval on it. You know, I, it, it's my, that's because these things are so critical. The issues that we're talking about, these are critical issues because they affect our heart. Remember what the Lord Jesus said? It says it's not the things from without. It's the things from within a man that defile him. You know, it's, it's, it, so that that's why these are critical issues. Well, again, if any of you on the call want this, uh, Ken can forward it to you, or, uh, or or I can just get in touch with us. But it is a little taxing. I will say that it's six, it's sixty six pages. Now they're not real long, but still, all in all, it so much of it is man's wisdom and. You know, I, I'm not a big fan, obviously. So at least they did come out and re, retract it. Now let's see where it all goes. Uh, but it doesn't it doesn't take away from the fact that they put it out there as official doctrine for the Salvation Army, which is just horrendous. But at least they did detract it. Let's see where it goes from here. And anybody else want to share anything before we wrap up tonight? Can you hear me, Carlos? Yes, Paul. Okay, uh, I apologize in the beginning. I uh, turned on my computer and I went into into it there, and I guess it caused the feedback with the phone. So I turned okay. on my phone. So everything's all right. One, one little thing I'd like to just throw out is, there's not only just authenticity, you know, the, the, the ethnic, ethnic nations and peoples, but it's coming down even more to class warfare. There's a have, a have nots, the educated, and the people that, you know, actually control this world with their money and their power. And uh, a lot of it's very biased and, and what they're doing in our universities and stuff. And, you know, if you don't have a diploma degree and all that, and, you know, you're just a common worker, you know, a laborer, it's kind of like they can sell your job overseas, and this goes on amongst all the nations. You have your elitists, you have those that are well educated, that you know are controlling the financial institutions and the banks, and have a lot to say with you know the jobs and stuff like that. So I see a a, a growing you know diversion and separation even here in America. 
you know, they claim that they have a large middle class, but I feel like the middle class is being sold out. Anyway, I just thought I'd throw that out there. Well, no, it, it is. And they're, they really are. They're seeking to divide us. They're looking for any issue to cause division in the society. But, you know, the one thing that I would say is that as Christians, our God is above all of these things. We are not, we don't depend on the government. We really don't. I mean, we, we have jobs and some of us might have government jobs or we might get government pensions or whatever. But ultimately, you know what? If those things stop, and they could very well in the near future, we look to God. God is our provider. He's Jehovah Jireh. He is the one, man, and that is, you know, so it, it's, for us, it's not a question of our race. It's not a question of our, uh, you know, uh, monetary position in life. It's a, it, for us, what counts is our hearts. Are they right with the living God? Are we in love with him? Are we having that relationship with him? That, that's what really matters. And then you have these people who are trying to take our eyes off of that and put them on these other issues. And we don't want that. We don't want the cares of this life and the riches of this life. To, to, to distract us from our relationship with the true and living God. All right, well, uh, any other last comment before we close it out in prayer? And next week we're going to go back to the scroll where we left off. Uh, any, any last comments? Who will close us in prayer tonight? Ed, Brother Eddie opened us tonight in prayer. Who, who will close us in prayer tonight? Any volunteers? Or do we need to volunteer someone? Oh, come, come on, on now. I'll someone? Come. Okay. Come. Great. Cindy, I'll volunteer me. <laughs> Go ahead, Cindy. Okay. Oh, Father. Uh, oh, we come to you tonight, Lord, and and thankful that we come together. But Lord, the things that we have read tonight, this that was the Salvation Army has put out, has troubled my heart, Lord. It has troubled me and saddened me when I read this. Because this is something that I just couldn't believe. I was angry at first, but it all just turned to sadness to think that something like this has come out because it causes to divide us and not un unite us. And it, I know, Lord, that as uh, those that love you, those Christians that are true in heart, we don't look at someone on the outside as God looks at our hearts. We should be able to look beyond what's on the outside and see that heart of that person and love them because they, because of uh, being fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. And even if not, as we've been talking, we are to go out and spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is what we are told to do, and that's what we should be doing, regardless of where they live or how they look or how anybody is. We have to reach their hearts, Lord, with your truth. And so I'm thankful that we can discuss these things, but know that others, and when I think about it, and I think just about the country and where it's going in the world, this, this is our place, our safe place. That's what hurt so much was thinking that church. I thought that was my safe place. But I realize now as the Lord speaks to me that I, that he, is the safe place. Yes. He's the one I turn to. He's the one whose arms I run to. And he's the one that will take care of us and take care of me and, and watch over me. He is where I go. And yes. he is all that matters to me. So, Lord, as uh, we continue, and it's good to bring these things out. And I pray, Lord, that there will be a change in the army of those that put this forth. I don't understand why it came out. Was it one issue in a certain area? But, Lord, this to be a teaching, I felt like it was... Like we watched Schindler's List the other night, and I, I thought, my God, this is, could happen all over again. It happened before. It'll happen with... 
you know, Christians would be are being persecuted. But Lord, this can happen in our country, United States of America, one nation under God. Oh, but Lord, we're thankful that we are together, that we share uh, a heart with Jesus, that we are like-minded, like-hearted. We thank you, Lord, for those on this call. Bless each and every one and their families. Those that need a physical healing, Lord, I pray that you would touch, that you would advance the gospel through them. And I pray, Lord, for a revival within our church, knowing that the revival starts with me. Now, Lord, we thank you and ask this all in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you, Cindy. Did you ever uh, start let, the recording? I'm sorry? Did you ever start the recording? I did. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm getting ready to stop it right now. <laughs>